Thank you for being here so early. You know, we have a tough time getting the tents full uh, at uh, right, right off the bat. But we thought we'd put the most appetizing <laughs> <laughs> topics up first, and we might get a uh, better showing. Uh, of course, this is Eat Your Landscape. Joanne Skelly is the extension educator in uh, Carson City. She happens to be my counterpart with the University of Nevada Cooperative Extension. And Joanne has an extensive background in horticulture. Uh, I don't know if she's got an extensive background of eating her landscape, but we'll find out. Please help me welcome Joanne Skelly. <laughs> yeah, right. do I eat my landscape? I have parts of it, not all of it. Now, I'm really glad to see you here today because in this day and age with the way the economy is going and Knowing that water is such a finite resource for us here in Nevada, that we ought to be thinking in a new direction for landscaping. We ought to be kind of changing our traditional stuff. So first off, uh, my favorite edible landscaping author is Rosalind Creasy, and this is a fabulous book. And it's got a whole encyclopedia of, an, of edible plants, and I'll pass this around if somebody promises to bring it back. And so, you, it, she tells you all the cultural requirements, what zones they're good for, and she gives you a whole section at the beginning on how to, how to do different things in the, in the landscape. And so a lot of this that I'm taking today, going to say to you today came from Rosalind's book. But she would say, if Johnny Appleseed were to visit present day suburbia, he would weep. Rather than fruit-laden trees, he would find ornamental cherries, crab apples that don't fruit, and ornamental pears. So what I would like to get into your head today is that possibly that you could reject the impulse for the uniformity of traditional landscaping. Do we need to have, don't, I love this line that she says, don't be imprisoned in a home surrounded by lawn, bordered with a mustache of evergreen shrubs. <laughs> Isn't that good? I love that. And so break out of the confining tradition of using strictly ornamental plants in your yard because you don't need to hide your vegetables, you don't need to hide your grapes, your chives, your different things, your fruit trees behind the garage. You know, there's nothing ugly about these things. They have twice as much beauty. You don't have to have an edible complex. Oh, I don't want people to know. <laughs> you know, I don't want people to know that I have edibles in my yard. So I say, embrace foodscaping. Get into it. Get into it. So foodscaping. Eat your yard. Eat your yard. Yard. And what that means that is instead of picking up useless leaves from some ornamental shade tree on your lawn, what if you were picking fruit from that tree and you were going to can that fruit or freeze it or eat it or share it? What about that? Uh, instead of picking dandelions out of the lawn, imagine picking fresh raspberries or strawberries. But did you know that dandelions are edible? Yeah. You know, and they're very high in vitamin C. And we've all heard of dandelion wine. I haven't had any, but I'd like to make some someday. But you can't just go picking dandelions anywhere because people have used things like chemicals on their lawn. And so you would know what you use on your lawn. But So I don't suggest just randomly picking dandelions at the park and, and, and eating those. But I think, and I try to teach the master gardeners, that when we're designing a landscape, that Edible can be beautiful, and beautiful can be edible. It does not have to preclude one from the other. And so when you're thinking that, it don't think just the visual. 
think a bigger picture in your landscape about what you can do. And so then we can use water to greater advantage. Now, if we take a look at this landscape, this is a beautiful water efficient landscape. There is nothing wrong with this landscape at all. But what I'd like you to see, when I think this is a, a laser. Yeah, okay. Now this is Russian sage, and you can see them scattered throughout. But did you know that lavender is a wonderful herb for eating as well as for scenting drawers? And you can do all kinds of things with lavender, plus it attracts bees. So for the rest of your edible landscape, you would have that attracting bees. So we could replace these, and it's drought tolerant. So you could replace your Russian sage with lavender. This could be something like hyssop, which is a beautiful little mint family plant with dark, tiny, dark green leaves and lovely purple flowers. Or any chives, you could have peppers, cabbages through here. So everything that's in this landscape could be an edible plant, some of which you would want to be perennial because you don't want to lose your entire landscape at the end of the season. You know, a lot of our herbs are annuals, but some are perennials, like the hyssop is, is a perennial, the lavender is a perennial, asparagus could be a perennial and it gets a great flower. And then you can intersperse that with the annuals that you might use in a normal yard landscape, such as petunias or marigolds or things like that that are all annuals. And so this could be an edible landscape and your neighbors would never even have to know. No, that's not it. Or if they did know, you'd have to chase them out of your yard. Yeah, you might have, you might have that problem. And, and wow, building community and sharing. Oh, I like that idea. That's a green living concept. Now I had to throw this in because I just received this the other day because I'd been in Alaska in June and sort of fell in love with it. And my our boss sent me this picture and it's an 1100 pound pumpkin, <coughs> the award winner at the Alaska State Fair. I want to see this in your front yard. <laughs> Next year I want to see that in your front yard. You call me up and you tell me and you bring me in, okay? Now this is an important concept to, to get because we don't have a lot of usable water on the face of the earth. It's really tied up. We have about 2.8% of fresh water available to use. And if you look at that, if you look at that, that number of that 2.8%, look at this. We only have a small amount of groundwater. And that's being depleted all over the place. It's being mined on a regular basis, and that's not a good thing. We have an even smaller amount in lakes and streams. And in Nevada, it's like, you know, you can count. How many states can you count the rivers in the state on one hand kind of thing? Uh, <coughs> some is in glaciers and ice caps, and that's melting. Uh, and a little bit, tiny bit is water vapor. This is a very precious commodity. And what we do, and have been doing for a lot of decades, is that we put 50% of our home water use on the landscape and most of that is wasted because we don't know how to water or we aren't watering to a, a good, efficient system. And so, foodscaping uses your water much more to much more advantage than just the visual. I like this landscape. This is not a true edible landscape, but if you had a hillside, Think what you could do with the terraces and how you could have the bean teepees and pumpkins and watermelons and mints and all kinds of the rhubarbs and everything that you could put into a landscape like this for an edible landscape. There's no reason why not. And outside the Cooperative Extension Office in Alaska, this is their, this is their floral display. This is what they bordered their, land, their entryway with. And so they've got tomatoes, and they've got collards, and they've got a number of edible things here in there. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool to what? actually have it right there as you walk in. What part of Alaska? This was Fairbanks. Okay. This is Fairbanks. So we were getting 24 hours of sun about that yeah. time <laughs> in June. And then, at, and this is all at the university in Fairbanks. And so I'm walking by one of the dorms, and they'd done the same thing. They had their, they had their. Um, I'm not a, usually a laser user. This is this is rainbow chard, and this is collards, and then we have the beautiful butter lettuces, and we have some kale in there, and so 
Why not? And these things, although they aren't perennial, I tried an experiment last year in my garden and I let them go all winter long and then they shot up in the spring really, really early. So I was able to harvest stuff really early in the spring. And we had a pretty good winter last year, so mm -hmm. I was really pleased. And then they put out these beautiful flowers, taller than me. Yellow flowers, looks like radish flowers and, and mustard flowers, because it's the same family. And then they went to seed, so now I have thousands of seed pods. But I had all of these beneficial insects coming into the yard for the crop that I was planting this year. So although they're not a perennial, I was able to make them last like a perennial till I could get the next batch of plants did up you, and did running. Did you mulch them or anything? Uh, I think I, yeah, they had leaves on them. They had leaves on them. But they did really well. And for in some instances, and I'm finding this, I'm not sure if anybody else is, but it's getting harder and harder to get down and back up. Yep. And, and it's not so much the getting down and back up, it's the getting down for a while and then trying to get back up, you know. So a lot of times your raised beds can be a real solution in a landscape. And then plus, it is a water conservation tool because the only place it's getting water is right inside here. And then this could be all built up with just wonderful things of color. And that's why I put together this list for you of different plants that I went through Rosalind's book and just marked down things that I knew grew here and this is definitely not a complete list because I didn't put every single variety of thing that's available I mean you can get kale in all kinds of colors and you can get the chard in all kinds of colors and of course there's millions of fruit trees dwarf to standard size trees so you know there's a lot of things and this lady in the front mentioned what about wild edible plants? And I didn't even go there because I don't have the expertise in that. But it would be a wonderful avenue to explore. And it's, I do include some of our native plants on here that are edible. I do know those. And another, this is a wheelchair access uh, box that was, that was in the botanical garden at Fairbanks. And I thought that's a really good thing because then you can have people that have uh, access needs can get can have can garden as well. Now this is just an old wheelbarrow or an old uh, something from the mining days. You know what it is? It's a seat from a buggy oh. or what, what do you call that? A tractor. <coughs> a tractor. Yeah, a tractor seat, a buggy, one of those. You know, one of those things with wheels. Yeah. yeah. But this is nasturtium, and nasturtium is edible. And isn't it beautiful? I mean, that's something we plant anyway in our garden. But did you know it was edible? And this is something that I really liked for an edible landscape. This was on the wall of the Chicago Botanical Garden. And I thought, oh, if you had a small yard, what a great way to conserve space. And take a look at it from the front and see. OK, they've got petunias in there, but you could fill that with lettuces, and you could fill that with, there are some pansies in there. Pansies are edible. Johnny Jump Ups are edible. There's a lot of different things that you could put in there and, and have to eat. Herbs. Oh, wouldn't it be glorious? Just full of herbs <coughs> falling out of that beautiful box on the wall. I love that. The, I apologize. The colors are not quite as vivid as on my screen. But I know this is not something we could do. Well, we could. It's not likely to happen here because we don't have the water. But anybody been to Valhalla and up to the Vikings home? And there's, that's in Vikings home. They've done it at Tahoe. But I think what a great green roof idea. And green roofs, although not necessarily on log cabins, green roofs are actually coming back. The San Francisco Museum, I think it's called the Science Museum, there in Golden Gate Park, their whole roof. I just want to say the largest green roof right now is ten and a half acres. And it's on top. It's on top of the old uh, Henry Ford Motor Company roof plant, which was redone. Isn't that so they are marvelous? This is coming into. This is avant-garde right now, but it's coming into the fore, and more and more people are getting involved with this kind of idea. And I think that's just a, another great way to go. But then again, if you have beds along the side of your house, why not plant them full of beans and different peas and things that climb up the wall, cucumbers and, and things of that sort. 
And if you have hanging baskets, which in Alaska, they love hanging baskets. I probably took 30, 40 pictures of different hanging baskets because they were so gorgeous. But it doesn't have to be petunias. It could be any number of wonderful, edible plants. Just to give you another idea of, you know, they, they just did such a beautiful job on these. I was in Alaska two weeks ago, and those flowers are still blooming at the at end of August. Yeah. That blew me away. All the stuff that, you know, gone from here by June, and it's still going yeah. strong there. I, I fell in love with Alaska. I can hardly wait to go back. I'm not going back in the winter. <laughs> chicken. Yeah, chicken is right. But how about bean teepees? You know, and have, has anybody has anybody ever grown scarlet runner beans? I've got a bunch of them right now. And aren't they aren't they beautiful? They are gorgeous. And, and these are good too. What color are the flowers? They're bright red. Yep. They are gorgeous. I have them growing in with my zucchini. And are your pods red too or purple? No, but I have other ones that are purple. And so you can actually get the fruit that is a different color, and then when you cook it, they go green. It was just, I always wanted them to stay purple when I cooked them. But, but you could have glorious beds of these different things. Or if you had a bed arrangement like this, why not fill them with, let's, I'll give you some ideas here for these beds here. Okay, you could get into there, it could be any number of roses, because the rose hips are edible. As long as you don't use any of those chemicals for the insect control on roses that are a systemic, you don't want to have any of that inside that hip. You don't want to have any chemical use going on in your, in your edibles, unless it's a superficial, like an insecticidal soap that gets washed off. But you don't want anything that you put on the leaves or the ground that gets sucked up through the entire plant because then you're, you're ingesting chemical. So you don't want that. But if you're looking at, at perennial, you could have chamomile in there, you could have chives, you could have Jerusalem artichoke. It's a real late bloomer. It looks like a sunflower leaf and it comes up pretty tall. And then at the end of the season, if we have a long enough season, and this year we do, it gets a lovely little daisy flower on it. It's not real huge, but it's a little <laughs> sunflower type flower. And then you can pull them out of the grounds and you've got the chokes. And they're, they're easy to grow and they, they grow by themselves. You almost don't have to water them. They're amazing. Um, strawberry, thyme, those are some of the ones that are, are perennials. One of the things I learned yesterday, I was at a uh, conference at Western Nevada College on orchard and berry, de berry development or growing. And they mentioned that service berries can replace blueberries because blueberries don't grow very well here because of, we need an acid soil for blueberries. So service berries can replace blueberries, but you want to look for not the Utah service berry, but the Canada service berry or the Saskatoon service berry. And I think I didn't get service berry under the shrug list here, so I wanted to make sure that I mentioned that. So, and then, you know, under the annuals is basically all your garden plants. One of the things I, I was talking to one of the, math, the gardeners over at our community garden, and he had done artichokes this year. Artichokes are a long season crop, so they don't always come, and he's had six or seven artichokes off of his. But have you ever seen an artichoke go to flower? It's got the most beautiful purple flower. Anybody grow rhubarb? We okay. did on the farm. Okay. Did you ever let it go to flower? It, do, it kind of messes up the flavor of the rhubarb because then it's getting too old. But boy, if you let, my rhubarb plants used to be about this big around and about that tall. And then the flower would be this beautiful white spike. And so I outlined a path on both sides of the path. I put like these pillars of white. And then at night in the moonlight, the moonlight would capture on that white and it would be like, wow, you don't even need to put lights out there. So that was something. I love rhubarb and from that sense. I have trouble with rhubarb because I can't see adding that much sugar to anything. So that, that's, that's just a personal, like, oh, three cups of sugar. Oh, my goodness. You know, I'd probably put it in with orange juice and do that instead. But I'm trying to see. So other, and on here, basil. Do you know how many basils that there are? It's just tons of basils in all different colors. 
And of course, they're very delicate and they don't take the cold, so you have to be careful where you would put them. But if you look at this list, some of the things that do take the cold, cabbage, chard, endive, escarole, kale, lettuce, those all take the cold, so they would do really, really well here. Parsley does really well. And of course, there's all kinds of different parsleys too. And then we have spinach loves the cold. Tomato doesn't like the cold. I froze the top of my tomatoes last night. And I had covered them. And I think it was because the sheet touched the top of the plants and froze because the rest of the plants were fine. So that's okay. But I think that if you, I'm giving you an idea that it doesn't have to be like this. You don't have to have a four acre garden. We got to visit a commune up there when I was on a natural resource tour as part of the conference that I was at in Alaska. And this commune had this wonderful four acre garden. It was absolute, doesn't this look, I just didn't want to leave. Put me in the garden, put me in the garden. And so they had moose fencing. Yeah. You know, we don't, you, next time you complain about rabbits, think about having moose in your garden. You know, it's a little different. But, so you have things like the chards, and this, uh, excuse me, yeah, Swiss yeah. chard, yeah, yeah okay, chard. I'm all right. I, this rainbow chard also has those beautiful yellow stems with the red veins, you know, and it's just glorious. And this is a small version, you know, when, when chard gets going, those leaves get pretty big, and it makes for a very nice border plant or a filler plant, or the lettuces up close. That just has such a glorious attractive shape to it and then you go out every day and you pick a few leaves and it keeps growing and growing or you could try some of these why not we could grow them they're cabbages but they're you know yay big we could we can grow those it'd be okay that'd be fun and these if they grow in Alaska can you imagine how well they would do here and for how long that's more on the on the chart and when it's getting bigger that's in a garden situation of course you can always do herbs. Herbs are a wonderful benefit in the landscape, <coughs> and so many of them do last. You gotta be careful with your mints because mints can take over, so you wanna, it possibly, if you're gonna plant mint, you may wanna just plant it in the pot it's in, cut the bottom of the pot out, and that'll slow it down from spreading. One of the things I didn't put on this list is horseradish. Hardy, beautiful leaves, easy to grow, but again, don't put it where you don't want it to like totally take over because it spreads and spreads and spreads. So you want to put a barrier around it to keep it contained. But think about herbs and there's lots and lots of herbs. How about lettuces? You saw, saw the butter lettuce, but then we have the red leaf lettuce and there's curly leaf lettuces and gosh, how many kinds of lettuce? Then if you want to get exploring, think areas of the world with similar latitude and, and altitude that we have and explore the vegetables that they grow. You can probably find things that will grow here and then you can buy them in specialty catalogs and that. And then you can, some of those will actually be perennial, some of them will be annuals, but you can go there. Again, a nasturtium, tropiolum magus one of the few I remember. But that's a variegated leaf. I think that's just beautiful. You can do little designs in your, in your landscape to augment the edibles that you're working with or to give them the supports that they need, like the teepees for the beans. And you don't have to plant things in rows. They can be planted, you know, just in the landscape. I love chives, and I'm coming to a picture of chives. I love chives as a border because it stays, you know, about this, the flowers with the flowers and everything, it stays about this tall. The purple flower comes out really early. I've had chives blooming in February, March, you know, on good years where we've had, they can get snowed on and they don't matter. The flowers are edible, the leaves are edible. You can divide them every year and make more. You know, they're easy. Just slice them into pieces with a good sharp knife or a sharp shovel and transplant them where you want them. But they are so hardy and they're beautiful. This is a quince. <coughs> this is a different kind of quince than I have seen because the peach is, is a different color. Usually quince is sort of the color of this, the, this lady's shirt and this lady's shirt, that pink. But to have a peach quince is really kind of cool. 
quince, though, is not a plant that you would put as a focal point, meaning, you know, a big object of attention, because when it's not blooming, it's kind of not perfectly shaped, you know, it's kind of a more raggedy appearance, so it's more of a background kind of plant so that you would look at it more from the distance than right up by the front door, except at this time of year when it's glorious. Or elderberry, this is a little distant shot of an elderberry, but elderberries, I have, <clears throat> let me get a little drink. Elderberries, I've grown elderberries for years. The robins love them. And mostly I put my edible landscape in for the critters rather than me, but the robins love elderberries, but my elderberries got really, really tall. And then they get these great, huge white flowers on them and masses of these white flowers. And then they get the berries, and they're beautifully blue or red. And to process elderberries, you want to look that up, because one of them needs to be processed in a special way, or it's got too many alkaloids in it that can be poisonous. So you have to, excuse me, you have to be careful. So this is a flowering, flowering crab, and yet there are so many crab apples out there that, that fruit, and yet this is the, look at the color. I've got crab apples that do produce fruit, and they have a really magenta-colored flower, and, the, and they're kind of a rounded, flat-topped kind of look like this, too. You know, you can get crabs that go up, you can get them that go out, they stay short, they grow tall, they have big crab apples on them. Anybody ever had crab apple jam? Yeah. Some a master gardener made me crab apple jam one time, and it was the mo It was a beautiful. It was the color of my shirt. It was so tasty and beautiful in the jar. But you get them in. You can get them big, and you can get them small. So crab apples are another wonderful. There must be I don't know five hundred thousand varieties of crabs. I don't even know. Like I said, chives, these are lemon chives. So you can have the lemon chives, you can have the regular chives with the purple flowers. How am I doing, Steve? You're doing good. You're doing 15 minutes. Okay. Um, basils. This is just one of the basils. This one happens to be a variegated ba basil. There's the chives. See those purple? My chives are reblooming now. They stopped blooming and now they're blooming again. I love it. I love it. Uh, alpine currants, we have a lot of native currants, and alpine currant is one of them. Uh, Ribes al alpinus, or, and then there's, or, uh, and there's the golden currant, which is Ribes aureum, and then we have the Nevada currant, which is Nav Navadensis, Ribes nav Navadensis. We have gooseberries, but these actually prune really well. They're very hardy growers. They need very little water. It would be you have to be kind of a dedicated gardener to harvest currants because they're tiny. They're really tiny. But it is doable and you can make currant jam and use them in cooking and that kind of thing. But they're, they're small. But they get lovely yellow flowers and then the currants come out and the currants are usually red to gold. And very beautiful. And they prune nicely. Is it true if your power goes out, you can plug right into your current plant? Oi, <laughs> they. <laughs> so what I want you to remember is to eat. Thank you, Steve, for that brilliant. <laughs> another, another nasturtium. And look at the color on that one. I have not seen this deep reddish nasturtium. But you can eat your landscape. And I have business cards somewhere if anybody would like to uh, have information. You can cut any anytime you have a gardening question you can email me. And and that and so I gave you this handout that was written by a master gardener a number of years ago. And and she gives you some really good background material. I think I'll stand over here so these folks can see me now. Sorry about that. And it tells you about sunlight, because most of your edibles are going to need quite a bit of sun. And if you're thinking about fruit trees, obviously really good soil, because you're going to have them long term. Fruit trees, when I said dwarf to standard, dwarfs can be actually really tiny dwarf trees to standards are, you know, as tall as the ceiling. So you, for picking purposes, smaller is better. 
cherries, if you wanted to buy and put in cherry trees, you need two trees so that they pollinate and you get fruit. And guess what? The birds always get the fruit first unless you cover them. So a dwarf cherry allows you the capability of covering it without having to climb on a really tall ladder. And that would be kind of hard to toss on a really big tree, whereas a small tree, Steve and I can do it together. You know, so she does. She walk. She talks. To, walks you through all of the things that plants are going to need: water and drainage. She gives you some fruit tree varieties, and I have some additional varieties that I learned yesterday. <coughs> excuse me. Yesterday at our orchard and berry workshop, and so a lot of a lot of resources are listed at the end. So, do I have any questions? Greenhouses. Okay. Yeah. I'm getting to the point I'm tired of losing my garden in September. Uh -huh. I've heard of ones that are made of like bricks that seem to work. I mean, I'm guessing most greenhouses would get blown over with an hour. Now that is a really good point. <laughs> greenhouses sound like a wonderful idea. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad you brought up the blowing over idea kind of thing because they definitely have to be footed against the wind. And so sometimes I've had people calling me up there. There were greenhouses that they would found online and you just use like big staples to put the corners down. And I said, well, you're going to have to get the biggest staples possible and you're going to have to really be aware that this thing could blow over in the wind. So he decided to lay a footing and build it to the footing. Now with greenhouses, the issue can be when you think they're going to work, they fail. Because if, if you're growing all year, you need a heat source. Because there's, you're going to have to do something. Even if it's a passive way of heating it to like a very low 50s or something, it might be manure, fresh manure that you put inside the ground that helps keep it. It might be how thick you make the thing. But you're almost going to have, always going to have to have a heat source to make it work. Well, the opposite end of the spectrum in the summertime, we have amazing sun. And it gets really, really hot. So then you have to have a ventilation so people don't always remember to have windows or ways to open the doors. And then a greenhouse also has the issue of it is the ideal location for insects and diseases. And they just go whoosh, you get white flies by the millions, you get aphids, you get all kinds of things. So you have to be very careful and very aware of your, your, your challenges. Now, if you look at it from a, the idea just of season extension, That's what I'm thinking. you may want to explore the idea of a hoop house. And you can look hoop houses online or email me or call me. I've got a really good handout on hoop houses. Yeah. I just wanted to say there's a, Mark, Mark O'Farrell's doing a presentation on Hoop Houses at 1 o'clock here. Perfect! Open air. And I also should say there's, a, I've been dealing with that issue for a lot of people in the past. Uh, BC, BCGreenhouses.com, uh, I believe it is, because it's in Canada, but they, they make a whole range of additions, plus freestanding, plus like that. And there's a company in Colorado that does high altitude, low temperature, Greenhouses that are not designed specifically called growing spaces, but cool. uh, they're solar powered ventilation, so it's wonderful. Automatic, automatic calibration. Well, and the hoop house idea is being used widely in Nevada by growers that are that are are uh, actually selling their product, and so we're finding that hoop houses can really, really be a much more affordable alternative <coughs> to a greenhouse. And some people, some growers are saying that they grow all year in there. You know, they're growing things like the chards and the cold crops, but they're able to grow all year. And then they have roll-up sides for the summertime, so you could get the beneficials in and out as well as the critters in and out, you know, kind of thing. So that's, that's another option. So if you have an opportunity and you're interested in extending your season, I would highly recommend that you go to the Hoop House workshop. And Marco Farrell really knows his stuff. So, yeah. And I also wanted to add, what, what's your take on behind these? Because you're, 
your, your mention of insects and stuff between propagation and cross-pollination. I happen to be at a speaking engagement with the president of the European Beekeepers Association, and he made a really strong, uh, because we're losing them. Yeah. So I, and I, don't, and I don't know what, what, how that applies to here. You're, you're, you're correct. Bee, bee populations have been uh, on the decline, not usually organic bees. Bee, bee, beekeepers and, and apiarists that do this organically have been finding less, less um, colony death disorder. But what I found in my yard this year was I had lavender planted next to the cucumber and the tomato plant. And I would go out in the morning, and there were hundreds of bees on three lavender plants. And I never had the production of flowers and fruit on cucumbers that I did this year. I was so pleased. So I would, I would recommend, one, if you've got a garden, plant lavender. And that's just one example of the kinds of plants that you can use to draw in bees. You could build uh, colonies for the blue orchard bee, which is a native Nevadan bee, which is not susceptible to that. And they have, we have a, um, a handout on doing the, the construction of the box for the blue orchard bee. So if you contact me, I can, I can get that to you. And it's really easy to make. And so there are a number of native bees that we can encourage to defer this colony collapse disorder that is going on and is a big deal. Yeah, Vicki. And if you're at all interested in beekeeping, Austin Willis is going to do a beekeeping presentation over the Discovery Center at 2 o'clock. Perfect. Stay around all day. Yeah, stay around all day. What, and what other questions? Obviously, this was just a cursory touch on, on edibles. Yes? One question I have is I have pets, yes. especially dogs. Do you have any suggestions as far as healing your landscape to where that way it accommodates dogs instead of just rampaging and destroying your I <laughs> had dogs too, and one of my dogs would run over everything. I tried growing sand cherries for like five years before I figured out that if I put tires around the base of the sand cherry, so some kind of barrier that they got it in their head that when they went racing through the yard, they weren't going to do that. Otherwise, it's really protection of the plants. And so either putting them in an area where you keep the dogs out, which is really challenging. That's not how I lived with my dogs. My dogs went everywhere. Or protecting the plants somehow. It might be that you put up, um, and the ideal would be something attractive, you know, that yeah. you could do. And so the tires were not attractive, that's for sure. But I got the plants to grow. But you could come up with something. You could plant protective plants around the ones you really wanted to keep, maybe with like barberries with small thorns on them so that they get it in there the first time and they go, okay, I'm not going there. Those kinds of, it is, it's really challenging with the dogs. It's really challenging because I, I've had better yards since my dogs have passed on, you know, but while they were there, I, I did a lot in pots, you know, like the raised, the raised boxes and stuff. I did a lot in pots all on the patio and stuff so that I could have my garden right up close to the kitchen and the dogs kept the critters away from the stuff, but I had them a lot in pots. Not, there's no real simple solution. Keep them out or protect the plants or wait. <laughs> hanging, you know, why not hanging baskets? You could hang, you can have um, some of the baskets, like the ones at Adele's in Carson City, have you seen the restaurant? I mean, her baskets, yeah. that's got to weigh 16,000 pounds. So there are ways of creating really strong posts and hangers and stuff. So a hanging garden could be just wonderful. Or on a big, on a big post, you know, where you, you set the pot up and it does this where you can still reach it, that would be kind of a fun thing. Obviously, you have to figure out stability and down into the soil and cement and all those things. Or on a wall. Or on a wall like that, yeah. like that. Or espaliate on a fence so that you chain, train your fruit trees along the fence where they just eat them, they don't run into them. Yeah. <laughs> the dog used to get every raspberry. <laughs> I never would get, he would, I would see him. <laughs> Just lipping them and you pull it off. <laughs> any, any other questions? Thank you. Well, thank you, Joanna. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.
Bye.